Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about all things weird. Weirdo. <laughs> Before we get to that, though, let's start with a little bit of housekeeping. We want to say a great, big, very gratitudinous, no, grateful, that's the word, grateful thank you to uh, new Patreons. Woohoo! (laughs) People who've pledged since the last time we mentioned it, which wasn't the last episode, but before that, since uh, our last episode was recorded and released while we were on the road and was all a little hurried. So... Thank you to Andre Baltuta, Gabri Sobral, Felipe Platek, and Sig TM. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of people. Exactly. Thank you so much for your contributions, your support, the mere fact that you are interested enough to want to support <laughs> us beyond the financial um, help, which is also very much appreciated, is really gratefully received. It makes us feel all warm inside. <laughs> Thanks, all. That's awesome. <laughs> if you are interested in joining our community of Patreon supporters, you can go to patreon.com slash alliterative, or possibly alliterative endless not. I should know that, but don't. <laughs> Look, I'm a We're real professional. I'm totally a professional on the top of my game. At, at the top of my game. <laughs> Can't even get the idiom right. Anyway, um, and we appreciate everyone who's been able to contribute, whether in the past or now. Um, not everyone can keep going, and we totally understand that. And we thank you all very much. Thank you. Next, cocktails. Yes. So we are di- drinking different cocktails because we found two that were appropriate for tonight. Mark is drinking a Twist of Fate cocktail. Would you like to explain what it is and tell us about it? Yes, it is a scotch-based drink. Uh, specifically, I, I so it called for a smoky scotch. Mm-hmm. So I went with a McClellan, uh, Isla. You couldn't, didn't use the Laphroaig, eh? Didn't use the Laphroaig, no. But this Chicken is note. quite, well, it's quite, a, <laughs> it's quite a smoky malt yeah you know? and also quite a lot of grenadine so it's a sweet mm-hmm. sweet drink but balanced by the lime juice and also it called for grapefruit bitters and what we actually had was grapefruit and hops bitters mm-hmm. uh, but it seems to work quite well okay and i'm having the a scaled down version of the weird sisters punch it's actually called the weird sisters blood and hand punch and it's from a book entitled Shakespeare Not Stirred, which is a book about, well, of sort of cocktail recipes and snacks <laughs> <laughs> to go with Shakespeare. Uh, what does it call it? Cocktails for your everyday dramas. And it has a bunch of uh, Shakespeare related drinks in it. And so this one is meant to be a party punch and you're meant to freeze freeze ice cubes in <laughs> surgical gloves so that you have hands and or thumbs to float in the punch bowl. <laughs> Uh, I did not do that because I made only a one drink version of it. It's equal parts blended scotch whiskey, a red vermouth, cherry liqueur, and fresh orange juice. Mm. So that is, so I just did equal parts in one without any surgical glove based ice cubes. (laughs) All right, so I haven't actually tried mine. I will try it now. Hmm. Given my general dislike of scotch, it's quite nice and mostly tastes of. No, I mean, taste of all of it, but the vermouth is quite strong flavored. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to taste it? I do. And you can, you will, you will definitely taste the smoky. Yes. The smoky, smoky scotch. partness of scotch is not my favorite. The iodine of scotch is my least favorite. So, oh yeah, yours isn't as sweet as I thought it might be, given how much grenadine it has in it. Mm-hmm. And that smokiness it's, really it's comes through. It's balanced by the lime, so. Yeah, and also yeah. the smokiness. Oh, the smokiness definitely comes through. Well, no, but it also balances off the sweetness. It mm. doesn't It doesn't feel mm-hmm. sort of, you know, sweet in the same way because it's got that heavy yeah. smoke. Mm-hmm. Well, I think they're both nice. Yeah. Surprisingly good cocktails. Mm. Given that our 
entire search parameters were things with the word fate or weird in it. <laughs> Though, as Mark found searching. <laughs> yeah. Try Googling weird cocktails. You will not find cocktails <laughs> named weird. No. You will just find weird odd cocktails. cocktails. Which I suppose we could have ended up going with. But mm-hmm. Okay. So why are we drinking cocktails with the word weird or fate in them? Well, the central word that we're going to be focusing on today is the word weird, as we will discover the original sense of that word is rather different from what we normally think of uh, today for that word. Uh, It has more to do with fate. Right. So let's listen to the voiceover for our video on weird, and then we'll come back with more on the topic. The word weird comes from Old English weird, meaning fate, and goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root meaning turn. Think of the phrase turn out and you'll see the connection between turning and fate. It's related to another Old English word werothon, which means to become, as well as German werden, which is sometimes used to construct future tense in German, as in ich werde kommen, I will come. And occasionally the Old English werothon is used with something of the sense of the future of the verb to be. Weird is also related to the word toward, and its Old English equivalent, toward, which could mean future. Of course, the Proto-Indo-European root wear gives us many other words in modern English, many through Latin vertera to turn, such as avert, literally turn away, pervert, literally very turned, and version. Weird was an important concept, and much has been written about fatalism in Germanic culture. It used to be argued that Weird represented a personified fate goddess in pre-Christian Anglo-Saxon belief, though more recent scholarship is doubtful about this. What's clear is that the Old Norse cognate of Old English Weird, Urther, is one of the Norns, along with Verdandi and Skuld, the Norse fates who determine the course of an individual's destiny. Urther and Verdandi both come from that turning root, the first in the past tense, the second in the present whereas schooled comes from the same root that gives us shall and should in English, and thus the three have traditionally been associated with past, present, and future respectively. The Norns hang around Uðarbrunnar, Uðar's well, at the foot of Yggdrasil, the world ash tree that lies at the heart of Norse cosmology, and could bring both fortune and misfortune, and the overall arc of the Norse mythological story ends in the destruction of the gods at Ragnarok, the fate of the gods. And this is but one example of the fatalism often found in Germanic heroic literature, the glory of fighting a losing battle. Better known today, perhaps, are the Greek equivalents, the Moirai or Fates, generally depicted as three women, sometimes named Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos, meaning spinner, allotter, and unturnable, who determine the destiny of both mortals and gods. As their names imply, they were often seen as wool-working women, spinning the thread of a man's life, measuring his lot, and implacably ending it. Note that turning turns up at both the beginning and end of their job. It's no coincidence, of course, that there are three of them, like the three principal norns. Three is a significant number in many mythologies, and particularly so for women. There are many sets of three women in Greek mythology, like the Graces, the Graii, the Gorgons, and the Nymphs of the Hesperides. The fates have a complicated relationship with the gods in Greek myth. Sometimes even Zeus is bound by their decrees, but sometimes he is warned by their prophecies and is able to avoid his potential fate. And that grouping of three prophetic women is now probably most famous from the Weird Sisters in William Shakespeare's Macbeth. They appear to Macbeth and Banquo with the famous lines, All hail, Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Glamis. All hail, Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor. All hail Macbeth, thou shalt be king hereafter. And to Banquo, Lesser than Macbeth, and greater, Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. Macbeth, his ambitions aroused, then goes about making this come true by murdering King Duncan and taking the throne for himself. And though we often refer to these three mystical figures as the three witches, they're never called that in the play. In both Shakespeare's text and his source, Hollinshead's Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland, they are referred to as the Weird Sisters, that is to say, the Fate Sisters, since they tell Macbeth his fate, and in a way determine it through their self-fulfilling prophecy. In Shakespeare's time, the word weird had mostly disappeared from the English language, but it had been preserved in the Scots dialect of English. 
A 16th century Scottish translation of Virgil's Aeneid renders Parci, the Roman fates, as weird sisters. Shakespeare used this unfamiliar term because his source, Hollinshead, did, and he was certainly not one to pass up an unusual word. But the word was evidently a difficult one for Shakespeare's readers, as the early and authoritative first folio version of his plays prints it as wayward or wayard. Of course, in more recent times, the phrase Weird Sisters has become much more well-known, especially in fantasy fiction, like Terry Pratchett's Weird Sisters series of books, or the fictional band called the Weird Sisters in J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter. There's an interesting parallel to Macbeth's Weird Sisters in Saxo Grammaticus's Gesta Donorum, in which he tells a version of the Norse story of Baldur and Hother. Unlike the more well-known version of this myth told in the Prose Edda, Hother kills Baldur not accidentally, but because they are both in competition for the love of the same woman, Nana, who loves Hother, but with whom Baldur has also fallen in love after catching sight of her bathing. In Saxo's version of the story, Baldur is not a Norse god, but a demigod, and Hother is a human hero, who is helped by forest maidens who magically appear to him in a striking parallel to the Weird Sisters of Macbeth, and they may be the figures shown on the 8th century Frank's casket, which depicts several mythological stories from various different traditions, both Christian and pagan. While we're on the topic of Shakespeare's plays, one of the conventions he uses to distinguish upper and lower class characters is to have the upper class characters, like Macbeth, speak in verse, as if they're speaking poetry, whereas the lower class characters, like the porter who guards King Duncan's tent, speak in prose. Surprisingly, both these words, verse and prose, come from the same turning root as weird, as Latin versus meaning turned and proversus meaning literally turned forward, or in other words, straightforward speech. The metaphor behind verse is that the lines of poetry are like a ploughed field, with lines that have to turn around at the end like the rose in the field. And speaking of dramatic conventions in Shakespeare, the bard and his contemporary playwrights drew on two distinct traditions of tragedy. The older descends from ancient Greek tragedy, like Oedipus the King, formalized by the Greek philosopher Aristotle in his book The Poetics. This focuses on the character of the tragic hero and his tragic error, or hamartia, which brings about the tragic outcome and arouses feelings of pity and fear in the audience in order to bring about catharsis. In this form of tragedy, the individuals can control their fate and prevent their tragic outcome, but they don't, and thus bring tragedy on themselves. The other model for tragedy descends from the Roman world and is most indebted to the Roman philosopher Boethius and his book, The Consolation of Philosophy, in which we find the figure of Lady Fortune who blindly turns her wheel of fortune, raising some people up from misfortune to fortune and casting others down to misfortune. The emphasis here is on fate, which is completely beyond the control of the individual who is, to borrow a line from another Shakespearean play, Fortune's Fool. Shakespeare, being the clever fellow he was, sometimes borrowed elements from both tragic traditions. Macbeth is given a prophecy, but he makes it happen himself because of his own ambition by killing King Duncan to seize the throne. Is he controlled by the self-fulfilling prophecy of the fates, the Weird Sisters, or is it his tragic error? But if weird originally meant fate, how did it come to have its modern sense of strange, odd, or unusual? Well, it comes down to the fact that the word was so unfamiliar when Shakespeare used it. Basically, although the word traces its ancestry back to the oldest stock of English words in the language of the Anglo-Saxons, few people knew what it meant in the time of Shakespeare and shortly thereafter. And since the Weird Sisters were shown acting a lot like the early modern stereotype of witches, the Elizabethan period was way more fascinated by witches and obsessed with witch hunts than the medieval period that Macbeth was actually set in, by the way, people assumed that the sense of the word had something to do with witches. So, supernatural and strange. And it seems to be another of English literature's most famous poets, Percy Bysshe Shelley, who first popularized this new sense of the word, more familiar to us today. The phrase weird fiction was then used to describe the supernatural literature of Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft. And today, the word has taken on an almost slangy sense of simply unexpected or different. It's now everywhere, from film titles like Weird Science to the unofficial slogan of Austin, Texas, Keep Austin Weird. In popular music, it appears in the name Weird Al Yankovic, and in the lyrics, a Professor Elemental song, All In Together. There's no such thing as normal. Everybody's weird. Speaking of weird science, a teen comedy from the 80s in which two nerdy boys create an artificial woman, another sense of weird is odd or unusual in an unsettling way. 
The near synonym uncanny is often used to describe the unsettlingly similar, as in the case of Uncanny Valley, which describes the discomfort that one experiences seeing a representation of something that is similar, but not similar enough, to a healthy natural human likeness, like an artificial human automaton. But there's another twist in this etymology. The word worm probably also comes from that same turning root. Makes sense when you think about a worm. But the word wyrm in Old English was used of a dragon or serpent, like the dragon that Beowulf fights at the end of his eponymous Old English epic poem. And that brings us back to the Old English word weird, which occurs some twelve times in the poem, such as Gatha weird swahio shell, goes always weird as it shall, which some scholars have held up as another prime example, like Ragnarok, of fatalism in Germanic culture. The heroism of the great warrior Beowulf fighting a losing battle and sacrificing his life to save his people. Speaking of Old English, perhaps unsurprisingly, the translation of Boethius's Latin Consolation of Philosophy into Old English by King Alfred the Great uses the word weird to render the concept of fate or fortune, and some have argued for a direct connection between this philosophical work and the epic poem Beowulf, and a bridge between the old pagan worldview and the new Christian religion. But the word worm, in the sense of a small serpent, also brings us back to Shakespeare's Macbeth, who comments after his assassins have killed Banquo, but allowed his son Fleance to escape. There the grown serpent lies. The worm that's fled hath nature that in time will venom breed, no teeth for the present. And to bring us full circle, one other derivative from that Proto-Indo-European turning root is anniversary, meaning literally turning of the year. And since April 23, 2016 is the 400th anniversary of the day that, to quote William Shakespeare himself, death hath made worms meet of him, it turns out that releasing this video now is weirdly appropriate. So, for one thing, this topic intersects with my dissertation topic from my grad school days. So that was one of the reasons that I was quite keen on doing this. Mm -hmm. My dissertation looked at the conceptualization of futurity in Old English. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looked at the nascent constructions for expressing future time in Old English, which didn't have a regularized future tense as perhaps modern English does, though even <laughs> that is arguable. Yeah, wait, wait, that's a topic to, for another yeah. day. <laughs> You've got another whole video on that. Mm -hmm. And it started off with the question of how Anglo-Saxon translators handled Latin with its future tense, particularly with all the Christian texts, which often dealt very explicitly with future time and the afterlife and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And then expanded from there into a sort of broader question of what language and language change could tell us about cultural concepts about time and the future and so forth. Mm -hmm. So weird in its original sense of fate was an element in that work. Mm -hmm. In fact, I kind of got onto this topic by looking at that Boethius translation that I mentioned and looking at how it handles, you know, how the, the original Latin was translated into Old English. Right. And you mentioned that in, in talking about toward, the yes. word for the future. Yeah, exactly. From the same root, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, if you want to hear more on that topic, you can uh, watch our video, Does English Have a Future Tense?, which is kind of a summation mm -hmm. of my dissertation in a way. And if you want more on, on time and language, you can have a look at our video, Language and the Arrow of Time, which looks at metaphors for time, basically metaphors, you know, spatial metaphors for time. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a few years past it, but of course, one of the sort of kind of key things about all of that, as I said, was the the anniversary of Shakespeare's death. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, that was kind of important for the timing of that original video. Right, right. And if you want a little extra Shakespeare tie-in, you can have a listen to our Shakespeare film podcast episode <laughs> on uh, the film adaptation of Macbeth featuring Michael Fassbender. That's true. I had forgotten about that. Hmm. I will write that down to put in the show notes. You can then hear me rant about the <laughs> exclusion of the bubble bubble toil and trouble speech. Yep. 
I was very mad about that. <laughs> I think I cut out some of my ranting because I ranted for quite a long time about it. But yes, yes, our much beloved, uh, much sadly, missed, anyway, much lamenting. beloved by us. Yes. I have no idea if anybody else is scared no about it the slightest, but, but yes. I very much enjoyed. It was a fun podcast. It was a fun do. podcast. We got to talk to people we liked about movies we liked, but all things pass. Yes. Um, so yes, uh, as we like, as you like it, as we like it, that was what we called it. I don't even remember the name of our own podcast. <laughs> um, Macbeth episode. Right. I'll put that in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I sort of, well, I alluded to the the source that Shakespeare used, Holland's Head. Yes. Uh, and in fact, there are really important similarities, but also really significant differences between Shakespeare's treatment of the Weird Sisters and what he had in his source, mm-hmm. um, Holland's Head Chronicles. And they're, I think, looking at those, uh, it's kind of interesting and instructive beyond even just the issue of what the word weird itself directly means. Mm -hmm. So the three women are referred to as being, quote, in strange and wild apparel resembling creatures of Elder World, end quote, and are referred to as, quote, Either the weird sisters, that is, as ye would say, the goddesses of destiny, or else some nymphs or fairies endued with knowledge of prophecy by their necromantical science. (laughs) There's some good words in there. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's great. And in fact, I think if we... If we have the time, mm-hmm. I will read out the full passage of this encounter, and you can edit it out later if we don't. If we run too long, all right. So, depending on the length of our conversation, you may or may not be about to hear Mark read <laughs> Holland, Holland, Holland heads, Holland's uh, head, Holland's head, Holland, Holland's heads. I don't know. Actually, I'm now reconsidering this. I don't yeah. think Mark is in any state to read anything. <laughs> Would you like? For the to longest time, in? I thought it was Holland Shed. Well, yeah, it obviously looks like Holland it does, Shed, but no, it's Holland's Head. Uh, so Holland Holland's Head's <laughs> version of this encounter uh, between Macbeth and the Weird, weird sisters. sisters. All right, go for it. Shortly after happened a strange and uncouth wonder, which afterwards was the cause of much trouble in the realm of Scotland, as ye shall after hear. It fortuned, as Macbeth and Banquo journeyed towards Foras, where the king then lay, they went sporting by the way together without other company, save only themselves, passing through the woods and fields. When suddenly, when suddenly in the midst of a land, there met them three women in strange and wild apparel, resembling creatures of Elder World, whom, when they attentively beheld, wondering much at the sight, the first of them spake and said, All hail Macbeth, Thane of Glamis, for he had lately entered into the dignity and office by death of his father Sinel. The second of them said, Hail Macbeth, Thane of Cotter. But the third said, All hail Macbeth, that hereafter shalt be king of Scotland. Then Banquo, What manner of women, saith he, are you, that seem so little favourable unto me, whereas to my fellow here, besides high offices, ye assign also the kingdom appointing forth nothing for me at all? Yes, saith the first of them, we promise greater benefits unto thee than unto him, for he shall reign indeed, but with an unlucky end. Neither shall he leave any issue behind him to succeed in his place, where, contrarily, thou indeed shalt not reign at all, but of thee those shall be born which shall governeth the Scottish kingdom, by long order of continual descent. Wherewith the aforesaid women vanished immediately out of their sight. This was reputed at the first, but some vain fantastical illusion by Macbeth and Banquo, insomuch that Banquo would call Macbeth in jest king of Scotland, and Macbeth again would call him in sport likewise, the father of many kings." But afterward, the common opinion was that these women were either the weird sisters, that is, as you would say, the goddess of destiny, 
or else some nymphs or fairies endued with knowledge of prophecy by their necromantical science, because everything came to pass as they had spoken. For shortly after, the thane of Cawdor, being condemned at forest of treason against the king committed, his lands, livings, and offices were given of the king's liberality to Macbeth. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was I was reading uh, very archaic spellings there, so it was a bit uh, <laughs> a little choppy. Occasionally choppy. Yeah. I still think Shell Governeth is an interesting rather than Shell Govern. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, I think I probably read that wrong. I think it was just Shall Govern. I believe that because Shall mm. Governeth it does make not any sense sound at all. grammatical not, to me at it's all. It's not syntactical. No. Yeah. So okay. there you go. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Fairies. Fairies. So it's not entirely yeah, clear, clear what, what they are, according to Holland's head. Mm-hmm. But Holland's head is not Scottish. So even he is, you know, working probably outside of worth thing, culture, working yeah. from some source, presumably. Mm-hmm. It is interesting how close they're conversation is to what's in Shakespeare, though. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's almost word for word with oh, like yeah. changing for meter. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. And he has that kind of tripartite hail Macbeth. Mm-hmm. Well, and even what Banquo says. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, it's expanded in Shakespeare, but mm-hmm. why are you so mean to me? What about me? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and, and that's the thing. It's really interesting, you know, reading Shakespeare's sources. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you haven't done it, you you know, you'll find this a blast. Uh, you know, Holland's Head or Plutarch, Plutarch is in for the history. In terms of the, and the, the, the particular translation, we know which translation right, of Plutarch right. he was working with so because of the wording. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, it's 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 quite mm-hmm. fascinating mm-hmm. To, to look at that and how much he kind of borrows from the wording of his sources. And yet uh, the, how much the little tweaks matter. Matter, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How, how much, mm-hmm. I mean, better isn't, well, better, but better f- given the genre. How yeah. much, you know, how much a few tweaks here and there yeah. can really make a difference to... He uses how, what's how good, it sounds, yeah. and then he makes it better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's some more on Shakespeare. Now, I just, to pick up on that, you mentioned Shakespeare's sources, and we're obviously not going to turn this into a, an episode on the uh, history of Shakespeare, because that's a podcast in itself, <laughs> I would imagine. But I did want to just mention a little bit about tragedy and the history of tragedy. Yeah. Because you mentioned, you know, you were trying to be... This was back in the days when you tried to be really concise with your videos. Imagine what that video would be like now if you were writing yeah. it. It would well, have been twice the length easily. Yes. And it was certainly based on lecturing. Yeah. And even in the lectures, I would have gone Expanded into more, than more, that. You know, more detail. But so, I was setting up this sort of dichotomy of these two types yeah, of no, and that Which is fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but just to say that you were talking about, so you talked about Greek tragedy, yeah. and then you talked about Boethian tragedy. Mm-hmm. Um, the sort of missing link in between them is Senecan tragedy. Mm-hmm. So just to say a couple of things, first of all, about Greek. I don't want to get into Aristotle's poetics and my views about it in depth, but I will say you, you mentioned the poetics and they are important. Yeah, well, and they're that's, important for Shakespeare. For and those sure. were the sort of I was actually not even referring to the playwrights themselves, but to Aristotle and Boethius, yeah. two philosophers. Right, views because on because tragedy. in terms of Shakespeare, yeah. he didn't have. He wouldn't have. He, did, he wasn't he reading read Greek, Greek, and he wasn't reading probably even translations of the Greek yeah. at that point. So he was reading translations of Aristotle talking about it if he was reading Aristotle at all, or yeah. just reading you know things based absorbing the sort of mm-hmm. um, general view of how tragedy should work from Aristotle. But just to say that Aristotle's poetics themselves are retrospective, looking back at 5th century Athenian tragedy and coming up with a theory of tragedy and poetry mm. based on it. And there's lots to be said about how it is and isn't a good representation of Greek tragedy itself. So, yes, Aristotle, very influential on Shakespeare, is Aristotle a good lens through which to view Greek tragedy itself? If you're actually looking at Greek tragedy, that's a more complicated question because he's looking for a, a scheme, yeah, rather than actually analyzing mm-hmm. the, the the plays. As with many theorists, yes, he's he's looking for an <laughs> ideal theory, yeah. right? Of what is the ideal tragedy and how yeah. does it work? Um, he picks Oedipus the King by Sophocles. Not as an ideal tragedy itself, but as having, you know, good fitting his, some, his some theory. <laughs> fitting his theory to some extent. But there's lots and lots of of extant mm-hmm. Greek tragedy that doesn't fit Aristotle's theories. And that's not even to mention the many 
other Greek tragedies that don't survive that we mm-hmm. really know nothing about, but we have some ideas that they may not, they may have been even further outside of those. So just to say, um, Aristotle's important in the history of tragedy, but not, but more for what comes after him mm-hmm. than for actually using him to analyze his, what he was analyzing. Also, he was kind of a jerk, so, but you know, uh, that's a topic for another day. <laughs> Name me an ancient source who wasn't. <laughs> If we stop reading ancient sources because they were jerks, I'm out of a job. <laughs> um, that said, the other important link there is Seneca. Yeah. So Seneca is a Roman playwright writing in the first century CE who, uh, you know, he, he lived during the time of Nero and he wrote a lot of philosophy, but he also wrote a bunch of tragedies. They are pretty much, well, they are the only Roman tragedies that survive, Importantly for Shakespeare, they survived yeah. and they were actually quite popular through the Renaissance. Yeah. And, 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 and through the, the five-act period. structure of Elizabethan drama comes, is, directly, comes directly from, from Seneca. Seneca. Yeah. So yeah. what Seneca did is he took what was a slightly looser structure from the Athenian playwrights, where you had action broken up by choral odes, mm-hmm. choral interludes. And he kept choruses, but he, he dropped the choral odes as like part of the the plot as it were mm-hmm. so he just you just have a choral ode mm-hmm. and in fact don't, we don't have what they were they were just like a dance interlude mm-hmm. and so and he on his plays become this much more rigid sort of five acts and that's what gets picked up later also Seneca tragedy is very influential on revenge tragedies in particular mm-hmm. the revenge tragedies before and during Shakespeare's time of you know Marlowe and um Johnson so there's these really blood and guts and murderous plays, and that comes out of Seneca. And the interesting thing about Seneca, so his plays, for the most part, are all except one, which is disputed as to its authenticity, are translations, adaptations of Athenian plays. Hmm. So he has a Medea and a Phaedra and a Hercules, a Hercules Furans, a Hercules Raging, which I'm not... I don't remember which one that's actually after. It might be a lost Greek play. Um, But he has a bunch of ones that are, and an Oedipus and, you know, um, ones about uh, the Agamemnon story and things like that. But what's interesting is the difference in, when we come back to the idea of fate, there is a, a difference between the Greek conception of fate that you have in tragedies. Now, the idea of fate is not monolithic in the Greek tragedies, mm-hmm. right? The way that fate works its way out and destiny and prophecies is not monolithic, but there is this sort of prophecies and then people try to get out of the prophecies, which leads to them happening. There's this idea of predestination mingled at the same time with people making the wrong choices. Mm. It's their, they make choices and their choices lead them to what was predestined. Right. So it's it's this interesting, uh, and this too could be a long discussion in itself, this interesting connection between fate and actual free will. Seneca is a Stoic in his philosophical writings, and the Stoics have a very strong sense of fate and predestination, and or at least in his other works, he has a very strong sense of fate. How that plays out in the plays is actually a sort of topic of great discussion. You know, how does the Stoicism work? The interesting thing is his philosophy is all about like control of emotions. And then his plays are all about wild emotions gone completely mad Mm -hmm. and causing intense suffering and anguish and all the rest of it. So you can see them as sort of object lessons. (laughs) But of course, he's a man of great internal many contradictions <laughs> he is a man of many contradictions yes absolutely i mean he his, but, his own lifestyle was not entirely stoic so. no no um yeah no there's a lot of contradictions to his life uh but the contradictions between his philosophy and his plays are such that for most of the middle ages and early renaissance maybe all of the renaissance seneca the philosopher and seneca the, the tragic playwright were considered to be different people right everyone assumed they couldn't possibly be the same person that is now not you know generally we now think they are the same person but that's how different the writings are right. so you get in seneca and tragedy this relentless sense of things you know there's never any sense that anyone's going to escape the fate they're going to right there's just it, it you know 
they often walk onto stage. The main characters in the, in the drama walk onto stage at the beginning, essentially saying, so I am evil. Like Mania walks on and is like, so I'm going to live up to my name and be as evil as everyone thinks I'm going to be. And then she's evil. And then her <laughs> evil happens. And then she's evil. Or, you know, they walk on and they're like, I'm doomed. And then the whole play is them being doomed. Or Atreus walks on in the Thyestes and is like, I and Thyestes and Atreus both come on stage and are essentially, well, I know I'm a horrible person and I'm just going to have to be as horrible as I can be because I wouldn't want to be a half measured horrible person. I want to be a completely horrible person. <laughs> you know, there's no sort of, uh, there's, they're unremitting in that right. sense. Uh, not all the plays are exactly like that, but there's a real sense of that. Whereas in something like the Oedipus or even the Agamemnon, you get this, or the Medea of in, in Greek tragedy, you, you have this ongoing dilemma or struggle or, yes, there is sort of this force bringing you to the tragic conclusion in mm-hmm. an inevitable mm-hmm. sense. And often the gods or prophecies are leading you there inexorably. But people are struggling very hard against it. And it's mm-hmm. always like if they just made the right choice just once, they could get out of it. Mm-hmm. But they don't because of who they are. That's that harmartia idea mm-hmm. of the, the fatal flaw. Uh, it's more complicated than Aristotle makes it out to be. But the idea that they they sim- there's something about them that makes it impossible for them to make that correct choice. Um, so that's a different sense of fate. So just to say that the ancient world does actually have a very complicated relationship to fate when it comes to tragedy. And both of those things are coming through to to Shakespeare. And as you say, he's putting them together. But in a sense, those combinations have already kind of happened. You know, Mm -hmm. like there's already a lot of complication and nuance going on in, in the models that he has. So I have a little more detail to give about the transmission of the word weird. I sort of briefly sketched this out, but the curious thing, you know, that the the word weird owes its reintroduction to the to the English language pretty much entirely due to this Shakespeare play, right? right. Being able to actually pinpoint it there. Yeah. yeah. And even more curious, uh, because it was a sort of misunderstanding of the sense of the word, right? Mm-hmm. People didn't really get mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And it really does seem to be the romantic poets, particularly Percy Shelley, as well as John Keats, who popularized the new sense of the word. Right. Which was very different from the, the you know, the, the Scots language. And um, the Old English. Language. And I should say Scots language, not Scots dialect. dialect, as I said there. That's, you know, not correct. <laughs> so it it was in Shelley's 1816 poem Alastor that we see the first glimpse of this new sense uh, in the lines, in lone and silent hours when night makes a weird sound of its own stillness. And furthermore, the woven leaves make network of the dark blue light of day and the night's noontide clearness mutable as shapes in the weird clouds. Hmm. Meaning uncanny or strange yeah. there. Yeah. So that's where it reemerges mm. mm-hmm. uh, with this new sense. And then a few few years later, John Keats, a friend of Shelley, seems to pick up on his friend's uh, unusual word in the 1820 poem Lamia. I took compassion on her bade her steep her hair in weird syrups that would keep her loveliness invisible, yet free to wander as she loves in liberty. Oh, yeah. Steep that hair in in weird weird syrups. syrups. (laughs) Now, why isn't there a shampoo in line? (laughs) Weird syrups. Weird syrups. I know. It should be. (laughs) Missed opportunity there. Uh, Lamia being a uh, Greek vampire ancient Greek yeah. type type of vampire and this of. this poem was a if i recall correctly a a sort of longish kind of romance right. poem sort by a Keats. narrative yeah. yeah a narrative poem he did like his weird stuff <laughs> okay so given that the word was somewhat recherche to begin with only known through shakespeare and in scots english it's perhaps not too surprising that we owe such a now seemingly common and even slangy, I would say. Oh, to the point that it's it's 
it's a little bit emptied of meaning. Yeah. Right? Like awesome or something like yeah. that. Weird is just a, a really banal word. Yeah. Often it's just now. odd or whatever. Yeah. So it's it's odd that, you know, it's weird that, that you know, we gain this, this word from the pens of romantic poets. Mm -hmm. And Shakespeare. And Shakespeare. So interestingly, the word doesn't seem to pick up until the latter half of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. A few decades after Shelley and Keats. Right. Okay. And it even suffers something of a decline in the first half of the 20th century. It has this sort of brief little, you know, kind bubble. of bubble. And then it sort of sinks right down in the first half of the 20th century, only gaining in popularity around, uh, it, it sort of reaches its low point in 1960 and starts to have its uptick around 1980. Mm. And we'll include in the show notes uh, a chart for the frequency of the word weird and some of its close synonyms like uncanny, eerie, and unearthly. So it is quite notable that, you know, that, I mean, it has a very distinct contour. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's basically very low frequency until 1840, which mm -hmm. is well after the death, you know, but... I mean, 20 years after the death of Shelley and Keats. And then it's from, from 1840, it's, or just a little after, it sort of peaks around 1900 and then gradually dips until reaching the low point in 1960. And then from 1980, shoots up to its very highest point, actually, mm -hmm. is now in contemporary English. Mm -hmm. And similarly, if you want to compare that with the word strange, mm -hmm. um, it sort of gradually grows to a peak around, again, 1900. Mm -hmm. And then over the course of the first half of the 20th century, it dips. There's a little bit of a bump around 1920, but overall it's in decline until, you know, it reaches this sort of plateau about 1980. And then suddenly in 2000, it shoots up again. Really? In 2000? I feel yeah. like I used strange a lot in my whole life. Yeah, and yet, according to so it? this is these these this um these are, these, are these Google stats engrams? are from Google engrams. Right. So these are for books. Yeah, writing in books, which is always going to be behind speech. Yeah, but that's interesting though, huh? And so one of the things I wanted to talk about was sort of why this might be. The citations in the Oxford English Dictionary um, kind of suggest that the word was picked up by kind of pot boiler writers like Charles Dickens and Edward Bulwer Lytton. And so that explains that the, kind of the 19th, 19th century, century bump. Yeah. bump. Yeah. And then as for the 1980s or 2000, mm -hmm. uh, I suppose we can look to the sort of pulp pop culture references like the ones I mentioned, Weird Al Weird Yankovic yeah, Weird and Science. Weird Science. But it does seem to be fairly contemporary in usage uh, that the word has kind of reached its peak. Yeah. Uh, at least according to the statistics Maybe available. Maybe the world has just got weirder. Well, yeah. Global weirding, after all. <laughs> Global weirding. You know, strange days indeed. <laughs> I don't know. Have things got stranger? I wonder if there's, to some extent, I think there may be, so that, that little bump that I mentioned for strange around, you know, maybe 1925, 1930 yeah. might be a sci-fi thing. Yeah. Well, I do think, I mean, weird and strange, certainly one would expect in speculative fiction yeah. and horror and yeah. things like that. But, but the timing doesn't, I mean... The bump then, but why not an, a, a longer lasting increase? Because, mm -hmm. well, it's a fairly niche thing. And I think, you know, the recent use of the word weird is this very boiled down mm -hmm. meaning of it, right? It, I don't think it has that kind of uncanny uh, no, it doesn't, meaning yeah. anymore, right? So it's it's this. But why did, but why why did, did we that start, happen? That doesn't, I mean, yeah. that doesn't explain anything, mm -hmm. really. And I'll talk a little bit more later about some of the other uses of the word. The, the more modern, the more modern senses, uses of, yeah. the, of the word weird. Uh, but I'd be interested to hear in any other theories as to why the word the weird is suddenly a more common thing. And if yeah. there's any reason for that. I mean, a lot of this stuff, it's hard to say that there's any reason for any of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. People just pick up on a, a new word becomes kind mm -hmm. of fashionable. And once yeah. it starts to become fashionable, then everybody uses it. But yeah, I don't know. But the, you know, the mm -hmm. data seems to be fairly clear mm -hmm. that that is the, that that is the case. So 
Okay, well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to talk a little bit more about the Proto-Indo-European route. Always. Always about the pie. Yes. Uh, because there are quite a few derivatives. Yeah, from I mean, route. you just touched on them uh, yeah, in the video, right? Yeah. yeah. So from that base where, uh, there are in fact a number of other Proto-Indo-European routes that are extensions of that route mm -hmm. that lead to a great many English derivatives through various different routes going through Germanic or Latin or whatever. So the main one in the video that gives us the word weird is wert with a T, which gives us not only weird, but also the various words ending in ward, like toward, toward. Lee word, uh, wind word, backward. all of those. Yeah, backward, forward. Yeah. yeah. But also the, the word worth. Mm -hmm. You know, something's mm -hmm. worth. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the, the sort of universe of words from the versatile Latin word vertera. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Invert, revert, pervert. And universe and versatile. Yeah. Eh? Eh? Clever? No. <laughs> sure. I just said the universe of words from the versatile Latin word vertera. And you yes. just stomped on my joke, but. <laughs> so <know>. sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it just shows how how well known they uh, yeah how uh, banal they all are you know. <laughs> uh, there's another derived root. <laughs> rate. It's late. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Don't expect me to be catching up things. Sorry. <laughs> the derived root rate w r e i t w r e i t okay rate which means to turn also that gives us words such as wreath okay uh and wrath if you think about sort of twisted with anger mm, okay. that's what wrath means there's werg <laughs> w-e-r-g-h um, you know listeners you miss out by not seeing the expression that mark just yeah. made trying to pronounce that word <laughs> it's it's a it's an aspirated g so werg <laughs> again <sighs> afterwards yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, that that gives us words such as ring, worry, and wrong. So ring wraith, not that ring. Ring, oh, ring as with in a w. twist out, okay. twist a, you know a cloth uh, yes, to get okay. the water out. Right. Werg gives us so w e r g gives us wrench and wrinkle. Okay. Rake w r e i k uh, leads to wry, wriggle, and wrist. Okay. The root werb gives us reverberate. Mm -hmm. The root werp uh, <laughs> is a, no stop there. I just like it. Werp, werp, <laughs> werp. werp. That, that gives us rap. Okay, not as fun as werp. No, and as already mentioned, there's wormy. Yes, which gives us not only worm but also vermicelli. Of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so think about that the next time you eat noodles. There. They are worm noodles. Little worms, though. Little so worms. So it's okay. Yeah. So, as you can see, uh, this is a very large connection, a collection of cognates, and, you know, there's enough turning words to make your head spin. I and... can't believe you write these puns ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's one thing in a script, but these are notes for a podcast, man. <laughs> And then you look at me like you want a pat on the head. <laughs> totally do. All right. Uh -huh. So 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 what about personified fates? <laughs> I don't have any puns written in at all. <laughs> all right. So yes, we mentioned yeah, in passing, well not just in passing, but you talked about in the video um the fates and the norns. And before you get to a little more about the Norns, which I know you have to talk about. Yeah, the Norns are obviously, to, at least to some extent, influenced, influenced. by classical yeah. notions. So of let's fate. talk about classical fates. So the ones you talked about were the Moirai, yeah. the Greek words. Now, the thing about the Moirai, <laughs> in, in looking at the research, I realized very soon that there's way more to say about these things than any of us want me to say. <laughs> there, there's way more I to say. Then. See, that's one of the things I didn't write into my notes because I don't write puns into my scripts. <laughs> um, anyway, 
as with like, there's a lot of things in Greek myth where we say, oh, the so and so were such and such, and they had these roles and these names, and mm. blah blah blah, and it makes it sound like everybody in the Greek world thought of these people and these group and this names, and this is how it worked. And it's almost never like that. It's always much, much more complicated than that. So yes, the Moirai, Greek goddesses of fate. Sure, that's what the encyclopedias all say. But if you go to Homer, you see that he mentions the Moira, one person, or maybe Moirai. One passage has plural, but mostly only a singular. Hmm. Also elsewhere, the Clothes, or the Spinners. We'll come back to that. Right. They, or it, are not personified generally. There is an another being or thing called Isa, which means a lotter, or someone who gives an allotment, okay. which is also not really personified, but is personified slightly more. Mm-hmm. And then there are people like Themis, who is sort of justice, right. who is personified. So when I talk about personified, like in Homer, the personified figures do things like walk and hand cups to Hera and are described as having beautiful hair or nice voices, right? Like, mm. so with their epithets are mm. actually personified. Whereas the Moira and the Isa figures are described as like, uh, so-and-so whom the Moira has destined for a short life. Right. But you don't have any place where that figure interacts with another god. Where they are plural, is it always three or is it? There's only, no, well, there's only one place where it's plural in Homer. Okay. Right. And there's no distinction. I mean, it's right. just okay. there's a, a plural. And the clothes are spinners, but they're mentioned once uh, or twice and, again, not differentiated in any way. It's very unclear in Homer, and there's papers and papers and papers and books written on this, what the relationship between the fates or Moira and Zeus is, mm-hmm. like what the relationship between the gods and Zeus are. Maybe I'll come back to that in a bit. So we have this figure of the Moira in Homer, but it's not really clear who or if they really are even goddesses. Mm -hmm. In Hesiod, we have two passages where they're mentioned. So the Theogony, where he's talking about the birth of the gods, he mentions them twice. There's some doubt about the authenticity of at least one of the passages. But anyway, let's ignore that for a moment. They're called the daughters of night and the sisters of the goddess of death in one passage. And in another passage, they're the daughters of Zeus and Themis and the sisters of the Horai, the seasons who give good. Oh, okay, and right. I was thinking good. hours, but yeah, see, it would have, hours, more, seasons. It would have more it of a broad season, sense of seasons, seasons right? For, okay. um, who give good and bad fortunes to mortals at their birth. So in Hesiod, we have them mentioned twice with two different sets of parents, which mm-hmm. is one of the reasons that people are not sure about. In the first passage, they are called Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. Those are the names oh, right. are given. Okay. But it is not said what they do. So they are not given individual roles. Hmm. Now, you can derive them from their names. Clotho mm-hmm. means spinner. Lachesis means lot, giver. And Atropos, unturnable. unturnable. Unturned. There's that turning yeah. idea. Though a different route, with, with I a guess. Different, yeah. yeah. But it's the same idea. Mm-hmm. Um, in Hesiod, then, they seem to be connected to births. So they give the lot at birth mm-hmm. of other gods. In in some texts, in, in Homer, they're very much connected with people's deaths. They're mm-hmm. all about setting the death for people. In other hymns and various other places that we find them elsewhere mentioned, they seem to be connected with births and sometimes marriages. Mm-hmm. So setting the fate of a human at their birth. Right. Um, so in times like that, they're connected with Eleuthia, Eleuthia, sorry, uh, who's the goddess of birth, so they stand beside her. Um, they're invoked together. They determine destinies. Sometimes they're considered to sort of be impartial. You know, they just decide. They're often, though, represented as cruel and jealous and remorseless in their sort of making everybody's plan, the plans of men go to naught because mm-hmm. they have already set their destinies. So those are the Moira. They So you've got... These three, but in fact, Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos, their mentions by that name in Hesiod is in this passage that is disputed as to whether it's true mm-hmm. or not. It might be a later mm-hmm. interpolation. The earliest secure evidence we have for their names and their roles together is only Plato's Republic. So that's right. the fourth century, the beginning of the fourth century. So we don't 
like in all of the fifth century, they are mentioned in passing either individually by name or as a group, but their roles, um, they aren't always mentioned as three. They aren't always mentioned together. Their roles individually are not clear. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what I mean by Greek myth. We have this sort of neat package of what they are. Mm -hmm. But in fact, as soon as you go back to our actual evidence, you know, yes, maybe by the third century, the Hellenistic period, They'd been sorted into their proper roles, mm-hmm. but we don't really have evidence for that. In the myth of Ur in the Republic, um, it's possible that Atropos is actually created by by and his her role is created by Plato there, because mm. other than that one mention in Hesiod, she's not mentioned elsewhere. Mm. Um, Clotho and Lachesis are, but Atropos isn't mentioned till other than in Hesiod until Plato. So anyway, that's kind of interesting. And yet there is this, there does seem to be this pan-European triple goddess trope. Yeah. No, there does. A lot of the triple, I'm just going to come back to that in a moment, the triple goddesses. A lot of the triple goddesses are not always triple Hmm. until they're settled on as triple. Hmm. So, like, I just think it's a little more up in the air than we sometimes think of them as being. So I just want to sort of signal that right that it's not clear that they're three right until at least the fourth century they may have been like just because they aren't mentioned that way in explicitly doesn't mean they weren't right like people often we have we have lots of lacunae of these sorts because the greek authors all know what everybody knows about these people and don't bother saying it so we also have so the clothes, as I said, are mentioned, and that obviously is the same word as clotho for spinner. But right. so, so this association with spinning threads, definitely, that's a real thing uh, in art and in in their names and in the way they're referred to. The idea that they spin the thread of life, right? Uh, who you know, whether they have specific roles to do with it or whether they all do it or whatever, that's more complicated. But they definitely have to do with spinning. So that turning, that group, metaphor, that metaphor of there. spinning, right? and turning and thread Mm -hmm. and life as thread is definitely there from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. If it's in there in Homer, it's, it's there. The Latin version and sort of their native group is the Parci Mm -hmm. and the most famous um, example of them is in a Catullus poem, which I'm pretty sure I've mentioned before, but that's not going to stop me from mentioning and reading it again. Because, obviously. Um, Now, here again, to my knowledge, there's no absolute threeness of them, Mm. except insofar as they are compared to the three fates of Greek. So in Catullus's description of them, and he's very influenced by the Greek, so you would expect him to, but he doesn't make clear that there's three of them, and he doesn't differentiate between their roles. They all sort of have the same role. They're all spinning thread. Right. It's in his poem 64, and he describes what what poem 64 is very complicated, but it's a little mini epic. Uh, but this part is the wedding of Peleus and Thetis, the parents of Achilles. And after right. a big, long digression, you end up with the wedding and the gods are all there. And the fates sing a prophecy about the wedding, about this marriage. And... The ghosts of the gods seated their limbs at the weight benches at tables richly heaped with various foods, while moving their bodies in trembling dance, the fates, and this is the parkai in Latin, begin to utter their prophetic song. I'm reading this from a translation I will link to from the poetryintranslation.com site. Quivering seized their bodies, their white ankles wholly covered by the red hem of their dresses, and a red headband circling their white hair. Their hands were busy as ever at their eternal work. The left hand held the distaff, wound with sw- soft wool. Then the right, drawing out the thread lightly, shaped it with upturned fingers, then, twisting it under the thumb, turned the level spindle in smooth rotation. And often a plucking tooth made the strands equal, and fragments of wool that once projected from the light threads clung to their dry lips. And before their feet, bright wool from a soft fleece was guarded by a basket woven of willow. So, they're spinners, but they're all spinners, and they're all old. Right. right, dry lips and white hair. You don't have this sort of young one. No, and, they're yeah. all old, mm-hmm. and there's no clear sense that there's only three of them. Right, right. 
I won't read the whole song, but then in a clear voice, pushing away the fleece, they poured out these prophecies in divine song, song not to be proven wrong by any amount of years. And what they sing, defense of Thessaly, dearest of Jupiter's scions, adding marvelous glory to your great powers, except what the glad sisters bring to the light, true oracles, but you who accompany fate, fly, guiding threads, fly, spindle. And that becomes the choral, the refrain Mm -hmm. the fly spindles it's the refrain of their thing and then they tell the story the the sort of prophecies about the marriage and then they prophesy achilles and then they prophesy that achilles will kill lots of people and cause lots of people to mourn and Mm -hmm. grieve and then die so right it's this prophecy i won't get into the very interesting things that go on to do with the the whole poem but we get the sense that they they know what's going to happen right and they're telling Mm -hmm. everybody what's going to happen and there's nothing to be done about it even with this foreknowledge that Peleus and Thetis have, and this of course goes back to the Iliad, we know what's going to happen and yet can't change it. Mm-hmm. Even the gods can't change what they know is going to happen. So the Parkai are definitely uh, probably come from an independent or semi-independent tradition, maybe Proto-Indian, but non-Greek, but then are heavily influenced by the Greeks. Etymologically, they're obviously different. Mm-hmm. So I'm just, just quickly looking that up. Yeah. Moira, Moirai comes from the Proto-Indo-European root smear. So that's with a S mobile, uh, and I think S's regularly disappear before sonorants in Greek. So Moira. And so that root means to get a share of something. Yeah. So, so it's very much about of, the lots yeah. and the partitions and what is the what is your lot in life. Yeah. But I don't know what parka, parka would be. Interestingly, the, the specific names of the three, if mm-hmm. you get to that three, Nona, Decima, and Morta. Right, I wasn't sort of going Latin. to because I was... I don't know what the, you know, particularly the significance of that is, but... Well, um, Nona and Decima are just ninth and tenth. Tenth, yeah. And Morta, I guess, is death, so... Yeah, I don't know. I, don't I, know I wasn't going... Was. I hadn't gone yeah. that far. Yeah. I was just going to point out the Catullus poem and... Mm-hmm. yeah. So anyway, so that's um, a little bit more on them. Now, just to get to that point of three women mm. or the, the sets of three sets of threes so some of the ones you mentioned and a couple of extra ones the gray eye who are the gray women that um, share the tooth and the eye between them right uh who the it's in the famously perseus. it's in the Perth- perseus story he has to they know the way to the gorgons yeah and he has to steal their their eye mm-hmm. to make them talk interestingly though in many versions of the story there's only two of them Oh. And some of them, there are right. three. Right. The graces mm-hmm. are another that you mentioned. In art, there's always only three of them, and often mm-hmm. they are spoken of as three, but there's many, many different names. <laughs> so the three, you know, mm-hmm. a set of mm-hmm. three, but there's individual graces that are mentioned as married to different divine figures at different times. And so there's, you know, there's a list of, I don't know, on the theoi.com which is where i go to look some of these things right. up it's a good place because it, it gives them um, references to all the primary sources and it gives like the extracts from a bunch mm-hmm. of primary sources it's like 18 names name listed mm-hmm. so while they're always represented as a group of three there's a lot more than three right. in, in the stories then the gorgons and again there you, in some versions of the story there's three gorgons three sisters mm-hmm. monsters but in others, the first the first Gorgo that we hear of is in Hesiod, I believe, and is just a singular monster. Right. And then also often you get Medusa as a singular yeah. figure. Right. But sometimes they're three. So like you feel like there's this sort of pressure towards a three hmm. that that everybody wants there to be three, but these stories all kind of converge on threes, but don't necessarily originate with threes. Which is why I think there there may have been some kind of group of three in some very old, you know, Indo-European yeah, tradition what, that that things sort of become associated with because yeah, you know, maybe it's a common, or or maybe it's, yeah, it's already a pattern. So. Or maybe it's a newer pattern that people well, like started, pattern. you yeah. know, because you have all these things which seem mm-hmm. to sort of in their first mentions are not threes, but by the later mm-hmm. mentions have become a threes. Yeah. So I, it, it's just that you find it in a lot of different traditions. But I wonder how much of that is the pressure of the in, you know once they've all been sorted into their threes in the hellenistic yeah. period now everybody else that, that influence now that everything cultures. else becomes threes Could so be. you know i just i feel like there should be a grain of salt we should take with with their right. our emphasis on threes but that said there's the hesperides who mm-hmm. are the nymphs of the hesperus uh, 
the nymphs of the evening Mm -hmm. associated with sunset and they guard the golden apples in the west and they seem to have always been three okay they're mentioned as three there's the furies Right. Which you didn't mention in the video, mm-hmm. which I don't know why I didn't suggest that when you were asking me about them, because they're famously, there are three of them now. In some version, sometimes there are more of them. Sometimes there are sort of an indeterminate number of them, or they're said to be produced by the blood of kin slaying. And so the idea is there's sort of a, in a sense, infinite number of them. Right. But there are three named Furies. And certainly by the Roman period, there are three Furies right. that are always being mentioned. Uh, Arignes. So there's that's the three. There are also male trios. So the Hecan Hecaton Carides, the hundred handed oh, men. Right, yeah. The hundred handed yeah. ones. Um the, Those are the, crazy. <laughs> the great. The sons of, of Gaia. Yeah. Um there there's three of them. Mm-hmm. Uh the Cyclops Cyclopes, not the ones that Odysseus meets, mm-hmm. but the ones who are the Smiths for Hephaestus. Oh, okay. So Hephaestus has sort of the workers under Mount Etna mm. in his 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 workshop is under Mount Etna mm-hmm. has cyclo- the Cyclopes in uh, Homer and there's three of them so they are his helpers so there are there are male threesomes as well fewer you know that it, it does seem to be a much more common with right female groupings um, and of course you have the muses who are nine mm-hmm. and you know I don't think it's a coincidence that they are three threes right but there are some male trios mm-hmm. too. I do. I mean, I do think that there's no question that the number three is clearly a yeah. significant number that is, you know, meaningful to Proto-Indo-European or well, to Indo-European you see the groupings. Sort of so-called matroni mm-hmm. across Indo across European traditions, yeah. Celtic yeah. and whatever. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I'm not generally saying that the number mm-hmm. three doesn't have significance or anything. I just think it's interesting how many of those, when I, they were all the threes that I had in my head. Right. When I went to look at them, they how many of them threes. weren't yeah. actually threes? Mm-hmm. Whether I think, you know, in or our actual sources, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. they were not consistently threes mm-hmm. in when you actually look at the sources for them. Right. Uh, so I think that that's just worth pointing out. And that seems to be true even of the Moira. Right. Moira, right? Mm-hmm. That in our earliest version, in Homer, anyway, there's no threeness about them. Right. So just to point that out. So I said that one of the sort of points of contention is what the relationship between the fate and the gods is. Right. Again, books have been written on this. So I'm not going to go into really, really great detail, but I'll just read a couple of the passages where this sort of comes up. So the most famous section in the Iliad where there's sort of a conflict, or at least there's a dispute over it, but anyway, it could be seen to be a conflict between fate and, and Zeus. And, right, okay. So Zeus, you know, Zeus is generally seen to be the one in charge of the gods and the one in charge, he's frequently referred to as in charge of the fates of man hmm. and gods. But in the Iliad on, in uh, book 16, his son dies. And he Which gets, son? Uh, <laughs> his son Sarpedon dies. So I'll just read... What this translation says, now there's some, you know, translation is translation. Right. There's different ways to translate it. But anyway. The son of Kronos of the Crooked Ways saw what was happening and was distressed. He sighed and said to Hera, his sister and his wife, Fate is unkind to me. Sarpedon, whom I dearly love, is destined to be killed by Patroclus, son of Minoetius. I wonder now. I am in two minds. Shall I snatch him up and set him down alive in the rich land of Lycia, far from the war and all its tears? Or shall I let him fall to the son of Monoetius this very day? Dread son of Cronos, you amaze me, replied the ox-eyed queen of heaven. Are you proposing to reprieve a mortal man whose doom has long been settled from the pains of death? Do as you please, but do not expect the rest of the immortals to applaud. There is this point, too, that you should bear in mind. If you send Sarpedon home alive, what is to prevent some other god from trying to rescue his own son from the fight? A number of the combatants at Troy are sons of gods who would resent your action bitterly. No, if you love and pity Sarpedon, let him fall in mortal combat with Patroclus, and when the breath has left his lips, send death and the sweet god of sleep to take him up, and bring him to the broad realm of Lycia, where his kinsmen and retainers will give him burial, with the barrow and monuments that are a dead men's rights. The father of men and gods made no demur, but he did send down a shower of bloody raindrops to the earth, as a tribute to his beloved son, whom Patroclus was about to kill in the deep-soiled land of Troy, far from his own country. So the point here is that he is saying, he says, fate is unkind to me. Hmm. So 
that suggests a separation that something between beyond his, him yeah. and fate, right? Like mm-hmm. there is something that decides what happens to mortals that is not within his power. Mm-hmm. However, there are different ways of reading it and not everyone would agree with that reading of it. But it is, you know, that is a passage that it continues to be a central one to people trying to decide what is the distinction between them. There is a moment where it seems like fate is external to Zeus and Zeus even has to follow the dictates of faith. Right. Fate. On the other hand, you have other sections. And of course, part of this boils down to the Iliad is not like a treatise on ethics. It's not. It's a narrative poem. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be. And it's a narrative poem with all sorts of complexities of con- creation. So it's not going to be consistent to hold it to perfect consistency is ridiculous. But trying to figure out what, mm-hmm. what was the Greek conception of these things. You know, this is one of our sources. So. On the other hand, you have things like in the book 24, where Priam and Achilles are talking about, well, talking about many things, but Achilles speaking to Priam sort of says, oh my goodness, you, you know, you've had a pretty rough go of it. Um, he's going to say, I'm going to give your son's body back to you. This is that scene right. where Priam has come to ransom his body. And in comforting him, comfort in air quotes there, He says, we men are wretched things, and the gods who have no cares themselves have woven sorrow into the very pattern of our lives. You know that Zeus the Thunderer has two jars standing on the floor of his palace in which he keeps his gifts, the evils in one and the blessings in the other. People who receive from him a mixture of the two have varying fortunes, sometimes good and sometimes bad. Though when Zeus serves a good man from the jar of evil only, he makes him an outcast who is chased by the gadfly of despair over the face of the earth and goes his way damned by gods and men alike. By the way, this is the translation. This is a the translation I had to hand. It's the EV Ryu Penguin translation. Okay. A standard one. I mean, so there you have the sense that Zeus is the one no. determining what happens to men. Now, I suppose you could say that there's a difference between human beings' understanding of fate and God's understanding of fate. Right. right. So the fact human that it's Achilles... Human beings understand the fact that even the gods are mm-hmm. bound to mm-hmm. fate. Though Homer understands it because the muses have told him, for yeah. instance. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, you know, you can argue... I'm just sort of reading... These are the passages that are often brought up when talking about this question of how it, what is the interaction between God's fate and man? Right. And then the other one um, that's usually brought up is in book eight. During, this is just one of the many, many clashes between the Trojans and the Greeks. And this fighting goes back and forth and back and forth. Right through the morning, while the blessed light of day grew stronger, volley and counter volley found their mark and men kept falling. But at high noon, the, man, the father, Zeus, hmm. held out his golden scales and putting sentence of death in either pan on one side for the horse-taming Trojans, on the other for the bronze-clad Achaeans, raised the balance by the middle of the beam. The beam came down on the Achaean side, spelling a day of doom for them. Their sentence settled on the bountiful earth, while that of the Trojans went soaring up to the broad sky. Zeus thundered out from Ida and sent a flash of lightning down among the Achaean troops, who were confounded by it. Terror drained the color from the cheeks of every man. And then the Greeks start losing. Uh Now, you could... Discuss that passage for a long time, because this is in the voice of Homer, so it's not just a human right. interpretation. It's Zeus determining it. But on the other hand, he puts them in a balance and sees which goes down or up, mm-hmm. which makes it not his decision. Divination or something. Yeah, it's like it's somebody else. It's Some Is he like <laughs> finding out what... So is that Zeus determining it? Is mm-hmm. it external... Is he flipping a coin, basically? Yeah. Or is it like this a way of him finding out what fate has determined? Right. Is fate external to him? So you can see there's no, in Homer, there's no fixed sense of this. People have argued, you know, there's, I found an article that says very firmly that the will of Zeus is fate and they are the same thing and there's no distinction whatsoever. But many people have argued differently. I would suggest that I do not see a clear view in the ancient Greek sense right. of what the difference is between. And I mean, so when we look to tragedy, to get back to that, we mm. can see this too, because for instance, there's the Prometheus bound. The whole point of that story is that there is a prophecy about what will happen to Zeus that Prometheus knows and Zeus doesn't. And Prometheus won't tell Zeus. Mm. So Zeus punishes him by, or Zeus has punished Prometheus already. Yes. 
But then he finds out that Prometheus knows a prophecy about what will happen to Zeus and whether about how he will be usurped like mm-hmm. his father and his grandfather were before him. Right. And he wants to know the answer and Prometheus refuses to give it to him. And in the end, he agrees to do so only when after he's released. Mm. Heracles gets involved. It's complicated. And then, given that prophecy, Zeus is then able to escape the fate. Mm. Because the prophecy is that the son of Thetis will be greater than his his father. And that's what Zeus says, ah, well, then I'll make sure that Thetis marries a mortal. And that's Achilles. So that the son of that mortal will be greater than the mortal father, but... Right. That's not going to be a threat because he was enamored of Thetis himself. Right. So he then avoids that prophecy. But when it comes to fate, that raises a whole host of questions. Mm-hmm. How did Zeus not know that? If he's all, you know, if he's mm-hmm. the one who's setting fate, he would know that surely. So he, clearly he's not knowing it. But then how can he avoid it? Nobody else ever manages to avoid fate. Right. Like I can't think of another story in the Greek in Greek myth, where somebody actually manages to avoid a prophecy like that. Right. Though the prophecy does not say Zeus will fall, it just says... His you son know, will be greater than... Yeah, so he's able to, the, to get around it. And I mean, I guess there are might be other stories that say, if you do X, right. then Y. So, you know, these are complicated questions, and I don't think there was a, a sort of communal opinion on it. Right. And we can see that, you know, the whole question of prophecy... You know, the Macbeth prophecies are self-fulfilling prophecies yeah. to, in, in the way Shakespeare performed. Holland's head doesn't really come down on that. Exactly. He doesn't really say, and therefore he became king because of this prophecy. Right. But Shakespeare definitely makes it that, right? Mm-hmm. That because he was told he will become king, he, he takes actions to become yeah. king and makes it perfect. That's one where he hears it and then he takes the action to have it happen. Mm-hmm. The flip side of that is something like Oedipus the king. You have he a prophecy, you try it, to yeah. avoid it. By trying to avoid it, you, you make it happen. Make it happen. Right. There's a number of prophecies where there's a choice. So Achilles is the obvious example. Mm-hmm. He's given a prophecy about his fate, but there's a choice. Mm-hmm. And so theoretically, you could take the other option. He could have chosen not to fight, to go, go home and die an old man. Mm-hmm. But the question is like, really? Like, really is there a question? Just like with Zeus saying, shall I take Sarpedon away or not? Like, does he really have that option? Mm. Can Achilles really have turned turned down his fate? Right. Um, the same one with Agamemnon, like when he's told he has to sacrifice his daughter in order for the wind to blow so that he can go to Troy. Right. Could he have said no? And then the whole Trojan War wouldn't have happened? The w- the terms of the prophecy suggest there's a choice, but the sort of arc of the larger myth suggests there's no choice whatsoever. Right. So all of these questions that the Greek plays don't answer these questions, but they raise them. Mm-hmm. They're very concerned with these questions of predestination and free will. So that's an ongoing mm-hmm. issue. You have the same thing when you come to the Roman period, like the Aeneid. You know, we're told over and over and over again what is going to happen. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Definite prophecy. And yet over and over and over again, Aeneas has to choose and make the right choice. And if he doesn't, it'll all go wrong. Right. I mean, those those are technically incompatible stories, but it's the way it happens over and over again. So, yeah, fate's complicated. <laughs> well, in I mean, in terms of Shakespeare's approach to tragedy, the rule of thumb is that he moves from the sort of fate is unavoidable kind of Boethian tragedy to the Greek model where the the focus of the tragedy is more on the character of the protagonist. Mm-hmm. And so if you look at his great, tra- his so-called great tragedies, you know, Macbeth, Lear, uh, Hamlet, Othello, those are all the sort of character driven kind character of character flaw character yeah. flaw kind of thing whereas the early ones are more in the sort of medieval mold of what a tragedy is which is very much based on that boethian idea of fate which is you know fate is unavoidable mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. though macbeth is very much half and half and and i mean there's elements of that in even in hamlet with the the ghost telling him what to do and right. things like that yeah i mean it's never completely no well and even more so that sort of the pivot point 
and if you think about it, where it comes chronologically mm-hmm. in Shakespeare's canon is Romeo and Juliet, right? It's before the great, the four great tragedies right, in his right, later career, right. but it's after the sort of earlier kind of tragedies. Right. And there's the fate is in the stars stuff. And it has it. it so it has that star-crossed language lover, of yeah. the star cross lover, mm-hmm. but it also has, you know, this, this notion of tragic flaws like the frailty the of the individuals yeah. right yeah uh you know they could have avoided it if only They'd romeo wasn't idiots. an idiot right well and particularly romeo yeah like even juliet though <laughs> well but, but really yes. it's romeo's fault oh, Romeo's definitely because stupider actually but. if he waited five minutes she would have woken up yeah, yeah. so yeah. You no know, yeah it's it's really romeo's the rash the rash decision right he jumps to a decision yeah, yeah. yes so you if you know if you're you know finding that that tragic flaw yeah. You would say, oh, it's Romeo's rashness. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of Shakespeare's change over time is moving from this medieval notion of tragedy mm-hmm. to this Greek Aristotelian. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, yeah, Aristotelian. Let's call it Aristotelian because, Aristotelian. as I said, yeah. there's no monolithic view in the no, Greek. No. Like, well, and this is why there's I think lots of it's... flawed characters, don't yeah. get me wrong, in the Greek tragedies, but there's also the sense of like, there's a very real argument to be had, of, for instance, about whether Oedipus really has a tragic flaw or not. Right. Right? Yeah. 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 Like, is there anything he could have done to avoid that? Mm-hmm. So, anyway, yeah. But, yeah, in terms of, I think it's a philosophical yes. distinction. Yeah. It's Aristotelian versus Boethian yeah. is the distinction there. And so that's Shakespeare's trajectory is moving right. from, you know, one to the other. Now, it's it's interesting, you know, that you talked about this sort of uncertainty about numbers of mm. fates mm-hmm. because with the norns you know by some accounts there were actually many other norns mm-hmm. and i so i hearing that it makes me wonder if i've got this sort of backwards but i initially thought oh well the sort of many norns is a sort of later folk tradition well everyone can have a norn you know there were originally three norns <laughs> you can but, have a norn yeah you can have a norn look under the chair of your your chair and you'll find <laughs> you have a norn norns. norns for everybody because it sounded like a folky tradition mm-hmm. you know everyone gets their norn mm-hmm. but originally there were the three goddesses right. and norns whatever so i don't know if i'm right about that but the problem with knowing anything about norse mythology yeah. is that yeah. You, you have know, such bad sources. We have these late, late, late sources, which yeah. are already kind of... They've been so influenced from other things. From and, folk traditions. And rationalized yeah. in various ways. And yeah. So, you know, according to some accounts, uh, there were many Norns, each of which who would attend the birth of every individual child mm-hmm. so that everyone had their personal Norn. In addition to Urther, Verthandi, and Skuld, who are the sort of chief Norns. Mm-hmm. Sort of more like the... Genius of a, yeah. of a Roman, yeah, Genius exactly. and the Juno of a Roman, mm-hmm. which is a sort of a guardian spirit. It's not the right thing exactly, but let's call it that. That's where we got the word genius from. But mm-hmm. it, it originally just meant the the accompanying spirit of every individual. Right. Man had a jun- Genius and genius, and a woman had a Juno. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and then also the idea of uh, as a folk tradition, the idea of a guardian spirit or a fairy godmother or well exactly fairy yeah. godmother yeah. uh so so this is how snorri sturluson describes it in the prose edda he writes quote there stands a fair hall under the ash by the well and out of this hall there come three maidens who are called urth Ferthandi, and skuld these maidens shape the lives of men we call them norns but there are other Norns who visit every child that is born to shape its life, and they are descended from the Aesir. Others still are descended from the Elves, and a third kind from the race of Dwarves. Good Norns from a noble line shape good lives, but wicked Norns are to blame for those whose lives are miserable. Right. And that just strikes me as yeah. kind of folk. Oh, it does, but like, but, but just because it's folk doesn't mean it's not older, mm-hmm. right? Like, there's a bit of a you're following. Like, what about a folk tradition means it's means newer? It's new, yeah, I know. Right? That's like, true. that's uh, that's not a not a good reasoning. So. No, but no, I can understand why you why you thought that way. Mm-hmm. But I th- I do think like that's what my grain of of salt was right. meant to be. Like, I think we need to think, and, and I am sure people have done this work and thought about this harder than either of us <laughs> right. know anything about it. But I just, you know, the, the sort of, um, there is now a received wisdom that women come in threes and yeah. fates come in threes and all of these things. And I think it's more complicated than that. 
but beyond that, I can't really say much more. Right. <laughs> like, and I think that's a good point. That's an interesting thing to bring up. Mm-hmm. Like, And also the question of whether any of these religions, these polytheistic religions, were ever as simple as there's X number and the, we know who they oh, yeah. are, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. whether that, there's ever a stage in any of these yeah, yeah. religions well, where that's true. Well, there's so much, so such a huge difference between, you know, the Norse mythology that we have from Snorri mm-hmm. in the, you know, mm-hmm. late later Middle mm-hmm. Ages and what we can tell about early Germanic Practice. R- practice in you know the second century or something like that. Well, and it's, and it's a the huge gap between... both chronologically mm-hmm. and uh, geographically, and so there, there's and no generically in yeah. terms of yeah no and, and in terms of there's the, no one the distinction. Thing there. And this is something we find in Greek stuff a lot too. The distinction between literary representations and practice, mm-hmm. actual ritual practice, right. is really wide. Mm-hmm. So when I talk about these fates, there are prayers to the fates that's different, you know, that are different, like. Yeah, the representation of what people actually believed in a lived kind of way Mm -hmm. versus what is written about when people write the myths down. Right. It's always going to be a huge distinction, too. So interesting, though. But in any case, I mean, this may be echoed in the idea of the sort of good and wicked fairy Mm -hmm. godmothers in, you know, fairy tales like Mm -hmm. uh, Sleeping Beauty or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, this idea of every person gets their their norn. Yeah, their fate. Yeah. And the good angel and bad good, angel good later on, and too. Bad norns yeah, and yeah. all of that. Also, interestingly, the name Skuld, one of the Norns, mm-hmm. also appears as the name of one of the Valkyries. Mm. Presumably not the same figure, maybe the same figure that becomes differentiated or mm-hmm. two different mm-hmm. figures that become one. Who knows? But, you know, these two groups of women, the Norns and the Valkyrie, seem to have been conflated somewhat in at least some of the Germanic traditions, depending on which you look at. So if we look at the sort of the, the forest maidens in Saxo Grammaticus's uh, Gesto, uh, Gesta Denorum, the Deeds of the Danes, which I mentioned yeah, that you version talked of about the, the story cauldron. there, there are indeed striking parallels with the Weird Sisters, and they do come across as something like the Norns, but they also have some similarities to the Valkyries. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So, well, that's an interesting. So, just overlap with mm-hmm. these Moira mm-hmm. are also very. They seem to be connected sometimes to the Furies, right. like this idea that they punish people, right, or that they they're jealous and mean, and they mm. like get between men and their. There, there seems to be a weird overlap between them and the Furies sometimes, and then also between them mm-hmm. and birth goddesses, which you also have with the Norns there. So, yeah. Well, in the Valkyrie, I mean, in certainly in in later, you know, Norse tradition, uh, are the the sort of um, shield maidens of Odin who mm-hmm. collect the, the souls dead, yeah. the, of the dead. But the word Valkyrie, or the Old English form of it, Valkyrie or whatever, just seems to mean witch or something like that. Mm, right. So it's, it, I mean, it's anybody's guess as to what, what the original sense of that was. But in any case, so here's, here's the passage from Saxo Grammaticus, quote, about this time, Hother chanced while hunting to be led astray by a mist. And he came on a certain lodge in which were wood maidens. And when they greeted him by his own name, he asked who they were. They declared that it was their guidance and government that mainly determined the fortunes of war. For they often invisibly took part in battles and by their secret assistance won for their friends the coveted victories. Right. So fates, but specifically of battles. Fates, but battle fates that sound Valkyrie-ish in mm-hmm. yeah. some ways. There's like right? an intersection between the two mm-hmm. of them, yeah. Interesting. And like Shakespeare's Weird Sisters, these wood maidens mm-hmm. appear to Hother again later in the story to render him further assistance. So there's a sort of structural narrative parallel right, right. With, between those stories. Hmm. So there are some other senses of the word weird, particularly in sort of modern parlance, Mm -hmm. that are worth considering. Uh, You know, I I mostly focused on the sort of noun and adjective uses of weird, but it can also be used as a verb. Mm -hmm. Um, So from the Middle English period, there is the sense of to assign a fate, to weird something, to assign a fate. And that's not no longer. No. Uh, And it could also appear in the passive voice, meaning to be destined, Mm -hmm. to be weirded. (laughs) 
Now you can totally be weirded out, <laughs> weirded though. Out. Well, I'll get to that. So when Frank Herbert used the word weirding in his novel mm. Dune, mm-hmm. and you mm-hmm. can maybe yeah. I don't know correct much to me say if about I'm it, wrong but yeah. here, but <laughs> he was drawing both on the supernatural and magical sense of the word that developed later and on its earlier sense of fate kind of related yeah. elements. Because yeah. it's all he, he the Dune is very the and that those that strand of it is very concerned with prophecy and foretelling the future and right. knowing the future. Yeah. But probably the most familiar use of the verb form of weird today is the expression to weird out. So as in to make someone feel uncomfortable. So, you know, so that's weirding me out, man. Mm -hmm. That's something the kids these days say a lot, sweetie. (laughs) I'm talking in the past, you know, 30 years or so, but in popular usage. It was the man appended to it that was particularly not... But yes, to be weirded out or to weird out or mm-hmm. whatever, that is a more recent sense of the yeah. word. Yeah. In mathematics, there is also a concept called weird numbers, which are explained in... So I'm going to quote Wikipedia here because, <laughs> you know, the math is kind of tricky. Quote, the sum of the proper divisors, divisors including one but not itself, but not yeah, but not itself, of the number is greater than the number, but no subset of those divisors sums to the number itself. Okay. You got that? I I, I (laughs) knew what all the words in that meant. (laughs) So for instance, 70, whose divisors are 1, 2, 5, 7, 10, 14, and 35, Mm -hmm. well, these sum to 74, but no subset of these sums... Of, uh, of these, of, of sums, these to sums to 70. Okay. Yes. I can't imagine why that's an, a category one needs to or wants to differentiate, but... So if you're a mathematician, you can tell us why, why this is an, an interesting, in, interesting property, yeah. but uh, those are called weird, weird numbers. numbers. Okay. There's also, this is something I know more about, there's the acronym WEIRD, or W-E-I-R-D, which stands for Western Oh, educated, yeah. industrialized, rich, and democratic. This is important in psychology as well as linguistic studies as well, but it comes out of psychology, to refer to the statistical bias that often occurs in psychological studies that are, as is often the case, based on sampling of easily available people, i.e. undergraduate students. Well, i.e. people from Western, educated, industrialized yes. I can't remember the other two. Who, well, who are the people at universities? Is, I know, is I know, but point. but but that's why yeah. weird, right? That yeah. they're members of that group because it's not just the fact that they're done with university students. Even if they're done more widely, they're still members of that group. True, right? The the what does it say it again? Western educated. Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Yeah, countries. So, like, because it's it's not just the individual people. I mean, democratic is not a descriptor of a person. Though educated, there's a sort of a yeah, social but the, factor but, there. But the, yes, and that is part of it. But it's, I mean, I've seen it discussed much more broadly than mm-hmm. just the fact that it's often done yeah. on undergraduate students. Even if they're much wider groups, if you take a psychological study and it's done in Canada, UK, and 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 the US, yes, it's Canada, the UK, you know, all of these, all well, all, well, all yeah. of those, all of those descriptors. That's the mm-hmm. point. All of those descriptors apply, even if you were, you know include other European countries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so when you do that, the sampling sizes, you know, you to generalize mm-hmm. beyond those populations then becomes problematic. Yeah. And it's done all the time. The educated and rich in particular no, but the countries, speak but to as, a social, no, but, but, well, socioeconomic Yeah, but status. I mean, all first world countries are educated and rich compared to countries that are not educated yeah, and rich. Yeah, I suppose it depends what you're comparing it to. But I have seen it specifically used have, yeah. to refer to to the countries, to the countries. rather okay. than I've, I've always seen it used to refer to specifically the the sort of sampling that is done well and, and by that's that's a, academics the, yeah. because they draw on their undergraduate yeah, students and that's and that's yet an, like that's an, an, an even narrower mm-hmm. uh, sample size and an even bigger problem certainly um if you're not even taking from a cohort but like the countries and uh, so i've seen in scientific american stuff talked about the problem of using in medical trials right. and like all of these sorts of things using people from weird countries right as opposed to in any um, case the point being that they are therefore not necessarily representative of a population of large or yeah. whatever population you're you know mm-hmm. trying yeah. to consider yeah. 
they're problematic. Yeah. So I suppose in a certain sense, what seems normal might actually be weird. In the other sense. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Sorry. It's just that I can always tell when you're coming to this well written note. <laughs> joke? No, joke isn't the quite rather right word, but the capstone phrase. Right. Yes. Well, can I can I steal one from <laughs> Professor Elemental again and say, uh, you know, there's no such thing as normal. Everybody's weird. weird. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. We'll put a link to uh, yes. that song. That song, yes. We're referring to it. And I'm sure many people do not know who Professor Elemental is. And He's your a bit life weird. Will, he is a bit weird, but I think this song in particular, your life will be made better by. Oh yes, to it. absolutely, it's brilliant. Uh, oh, I love Professor Elemental. He's he's wonderful. All right, so is that good? Weirdly enough, I think that's oh. all I have to say. It's a good thing that the people can't see what I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I think we have talked enough on this topic <laughs> for tonight, and. Thank you all for listening. Uh, I have a feeling the next few episodes are going to be interview heavy because <laughs> there's all these people that we know doing interesting things. But we will be back at you soon. In the meantime, stay weird, people. Stay weird. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.